tonight we have a very, very special guest. But first, let me introduce the co-producer and the host of this, Doug O'Keefe. A leather activist, educator, um, IML contestant wrangler, and former IML contestant. He was Mr. Selbach Sheldon Leather, or Sheldon Selbach Sheldon Chicago Leather Man. Oh, four. <laughs> 2004, yes. And, uh, so he will be conducting the interview with the most amazing and wonderful Lori Cannon. Um, I first met Lori in 1987, I believe, or 88, as we were, we were both on the steering committee for the first display, of, traveling display of the AIDS Project AIDS Memorial Quilt. And uh, been with Lori through CIFAR, ACT UP, Open Hand, Vital Bridges, and all she ever wanted to do was feed people, and feed people in nourish than she has, in heart, soul, mind, and body. And she is escorted by uh, Art Johnson, Johnson co-owner of Sidetracks, the wonderful bar, which we encourage you to know. Okay, the drawer of questions dum, dum, dum. for Lori Cannon, our special guest. So Lori, where were you born? In Chicago, 1951. <coughs> Whereabouts in Chicago? Right. Albany Park. Okay. Albany Park. And uh, moved into Rogers Park later. You told me in our previous in our previous research that your father was a very accomplished man. Why would he change your family name from Cohen to Cannon? Uh, back when uh, the veterans uh, were coming back home after World War II, Dad was in the Marine Corps in the South Pacific. He had a family to support, and he started selling insurance. And the name Lee Cohen uh, was responsible for a lot of anti-Semitism that came his way, which uh, interfered you know, with his success because he was a born salesman. And he picked a name that sounded kind of nondescript. And so Leo Cohen became Lee Cannon. And things took off. Uh, life insurance and he was with a uh, liquor distributor for a long time and made all kinds of records. And there was just something real appealing about his style. And uh, he, he hit the road. He always had um, districts uh, around the country uh, with insurance. And eventually, he wound up in uh, television sales. Tell us a bit about that. That was, uh, I don't know if you recall in the old days, at 4 o'clock there might have been a movie on or a 10.30 movie and he had a package of films that were given to him to sell to a region and he was just very popular. People were buying these films and on one trip to the West Coast he mm -hmm. met Hank Saperstein who ran the UPA Studios, known for animation. And uh, they did things like uh, Mr. Magoo, and the Dick Tracy cartoons, and uh, they offered Dad a position to be a representative out there, and he took it. I think he was pretty happy out in Burbank and traveling. He was, uh, he was given to the world, you know? He was just kind of given to travel. Are you to talk a little louder? Oh, sure. Is this thing working? No. Is, I, is the mic working? Over? I don't think your mics are hot oh. at all. <laughs> all right. Is there a switch? Did you turn it on? Maybe it would help if we turned them on. Okay. <laughs> a little on off switch there. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I tell you. Yeah. I leave him alone on stage. I love that. Okay. Better? Yeah. Okay. Better. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. You know, I'm lucky to be able to turn the lights on when I walk in the room. <laughs> We've had classes. <laughs> I'd like to visit your father's World War II issues a little bit. He 
You had a very unique experience in World War II. Tell us about the people he met and the influence that they had on him. Well, now it's kind of common knowledge uh, with the attention given to the Navajo home talkers. But uh, in the South Pacific, with Dad in the 4th Marine Division, with his colonel, who won the Congressional Medal of Honor, Colonel McCarthy, who was, you know, kind of an insider with uh, Richie Daly's father, kind of revolutionized the fire department with the ambulance services, the emergency uh, technicians. But during the Iwo Jima campaign and the various South Pacific campaigns, there were a group of unsung heroes, at least if we can have thought so, of uh, Native Americans. Uh, heretofore, the Japanese were able to break every single code that the Americans used as part of their intelligence. And the one code they couldn't break was the Navajo language. It's not a written language, it's a series of grunts and groans, and it's passed down generation to generation. And Dan never forgot the heroism of his fellow Marines. And these Native Americans at the end of the war were sent back to their reservations and told, don't speak of what you've done. We'll be requiring your services again. However, by the time of the Korean conflict, uh, surveillance was so advanced, their services were no longer needed and they just went about their lives, their simple lives as ranchers and silversmiths and medicine men. And so after the war, the 4th Marine Division would have annual conventions. The different officers would honor a, a colonel, a major, deserving different cities. In the year of 1969, my high school graduation in the summer, I went to Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> Lee Cannon decided he was going to honor these unsigned heroes, and he had to figure out a way to find them. He had leaflets dropped over trading posts. And, you know, fellows, we're looking for you in the bank. The drums are banging. Sergeant Leo Cohen is looking, please contact me. And with his friend, Tony Stone, the philanthropist, and a lot of businessmen in Chicago, they found a way. Because I, I was at home, and uh, hello, this is Albert the Gate. And uh, I was a Navajo co talker. And I'm looking for Sergeant Lee Cannon. And I thought, hey, another phone call. They made the lists. Their families, uh, their children were flown in. Just this week, I reconnected with Zani Gorman, the daughter of the late uh, Carl Gorman and father of internationally renowned Navajo artist who also passed away very young, R.C. Gorman. And we were reminiscing. She goes, Boy, I never forgot my trip to Chicago. I gave her my bedroom, and for her, it was a thrill. The canopy bed, and she said, your family was so generous, and your dad gave me an album. Because it was just such a wonderful time for me. And it was a big deal in the city. Um, they would come in, and you know, not all those don't really, at that point, they don't have bank accounts. Their, their wealth is their generational collection of turquoise jewelry that's been handed down from generation to generation. And I looked at this beautiful dark skin, the turquoise rings, the concho belts. It's magnificent. And to Dad's credit, he honored these men, their families, their kids were so proud. They didn't know what their dad did in the war. Beyond that, my dad wanted to make sure they got a presidential citation, which they did. Uh, in 1971, Dad and I went to L.A. for the uh, Tournament of Roses Parade. It was the first year the Navajo co-talkers, when there was a goodly number over the years, they dwindled. There aren't that many left. And that was the year of the earthquake. 
we had seen B.B. King at the Whiskey and Go-Go that night, because I knew, his, I knew several members of the band. And that was the morning of the earthquake. And my dad said, get dressed, we're out of here. Stay calm. I said, I am calm. He said, I'm telling you, stay calm. I, I thought, what makes you think I'm not calm? He said, well, you're trying to pull a turtleneck over those beer can-sized rollers, and <laughs> oh, yeah. um, so he was able to see the end result of just honoring patriotic Americans who, as we all know, the history of the United States with the Native Americans is not a good one. Every treaty was uh, ignored. And out of that, the um, tribal chair of the Navajo Nation offered the Anglo, we can, a job. Mm -hmm. He said, we're calling you we can do, because you make things happen. And he studied. He somewhat strayed from his Judaic background to honor the spiritual aspect of the culture. Mm -hmm. It took him about five years as an Anglo, a white man, to be accepted. But with his connections and friends, he was able to sing the Navajo choir to these festivals in Europe. He kind of revolutionized uh, some of the government policy. And I think um, he felt real proud to be part of it. And now, Navajo, the phrase Navajo co talkers is somewhat recognizable. There were books, there were movies, and he just felt he was doing the right thing. That had a very big effect on your dad, and he was living out west with the Native American people for a while. Yeah. You told me that at one point you drove out to see him, and you entertained the truckers on the road. <laughs> 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 I'll have to consult my <laughs> Miss Gaddy, how do you uh, advise me to I spit really, it out? I rule that you have immunity for anything you say tonight, right? Well, I don't know if you remember the years of the CBs. Uh, Ten I, four. My uh, my handle. I was the belly dancer, <laughs> and I would take Dan's uh, sixty one Continental and drive cross country, and you know. Long nights, lonely nights. <laughs> Those Union 76 truck stops were unforgettable. <laughs> and those truckers on the road for, you know, endless days and weeks were going to be more grateful. And I was only too happy to help do my part. <laughs> do my part. I, at you know, 3 in the morning, you're on the uh, CB and Uh, on a 
computer, we were able to generate uh, <laughs> the correct color and the numbers for the expiration date. <laughs>
I might see the big picture, but the actual minutia of making things work, I'm not very good at that. You know, I've come up with a few <coughs> ideas. And, you know, one night taking Cleve Jones home, he had come to a book signing for John Henry at uh, Unabridged Books. That was in uh, 97, a few months before he died. A wonderful book of a compilation of articles he wrote praising the neighborhood of Lakeview. And it was called the New Town Mythology. And Khalid was looking at the stars in the sky, and he was exhilarated to have a chat with John Henry, whose columns uh, baffled him. So, <laughs> he couldn't make head or tails out of it, but he enjoyed the conversation with this magnificent man. And he said, you know what, Lori? In life, you're lucky if you have one good idea. He said, I, I had one good idea, and that was the quote. And uh, it's so. You know, it's so. I think people in this room and people I've been lucky enough to know, they've got a couple of good ideas. And fortunately for me, they included me. And they let me work with them. So I consider myself fortunate. You inspire us, Lord. <laughs> I'd like to back up a little bit, though, because you've had some interesting jobs I'd like to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> for example, you were the matron of the Midnight shift. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a bit about that. And I would recommend that job for any <laughs> for any college student. It was midnight till six a.m. I kind of had a gift to get with the patient. <laughs> uh, I kept complaining, why didn't they offer can and towels? Wouldn't that be a nice little touch? <laughs> Not the current owners, it wasn't the Steamworks crowd, it was the Unicorn crowd. And uh, I think I did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us about your time as a preschool teacher of all things. Parent-teacher mm. <laughs> 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 <Our> conferences. <laughs> Driving for Latin school, 
Harvard School and Anchi Emmett. And in the evenings, I drove the coach bus for the road shows that came to Eric Brown. Back in the 80s, shows would come to town, like Sugar Babies, and Zork the Greek, and uh, it was a full day. Yeah. <laughs> it was a full day, and then field trips. You know, I would get a call, oh, the uh, uh, marching band from Northwestern is practicing at Dyke Stadium. <laughs> Uh, the buses are, they need another bus. Uh, there were nine buses all, I said, I'm on my way. <clears throat> Invariably, I would get the two bus section. <laughs> I never get the piccolos, I never <laughs> They wouldn't remove the instrument while we were taking them to their dorms, and there was a winding stairwell, and every week it was the same thing. I ducked, because I, was, I could have been decapitated. <laughs> I read the a uh, great group, and then that fraternity, where many of them are members, would hire me for field trips to Lake Geneva, uh, where drinking was 18 years old. They'd have a good time, and one night, the sheriff <coughs> approached me. He said, all right, lady, I'm not going to do an inspection on your bus, because I had a kid, of course which was illegal. I said, well, you're more than welcome. No, I'm just going to say this, plain and simple. You got a half an hour, get your boys and get out of here. I said, I get the message. So we head back to the city. But uh, no, that CDO came in real handy. Uh, when I was studying to get it, Victor Salvo was working behind the scenes to plan a big celebration for me. And he, he surprised me in all the birthday party like he did just recently. I said, aren't you embarrassed to know a foolish old woman like me who doesn't even pay attention? No. <laughs> also, by way of Tom Dabkowski, the Chicago House, uh, I would always donate school bus services for the field trips we planned to take the boys to the zoo, to the conservatory. You know, I was so inspired by Tom's promise to Patrick on his deathbed that he had to do something for the AIDS community, and I just never forgot how we created this bold and exciting housing program called Chicago House. That was 1985. And what makes that unique to me and memorable is that was two years before the historic March on Washington, when every other program got off the ground. Everybody came home from Washington wanting to get involved and contribute to the epidemic. But Tom did it two years earlier, before the community had galvanized or was cohesive. It, it was a struggle, you know? And uh, I know those board meetings were tempestuous. Because <laughs> I would see Arlene Halko afterwards. She was you know, she needed to be resuscitated. She <laughs> was on in. I you still have stars. You had to pick her up off the floor. It was oh. hers because, of course, I was there always for the last hamburger. My favorite hamburgers. I'd go in. I'd say, oh, I mean, Irene, you look a little uh, overwhelmed. She was all the shouting. The, she says, but I love Tom. You know, I would always, just like John Henry said, the gay community is like a family picnic. It starts off with quarreling, starts off with insults, and by the end of the day, you know what? Everybody's come together again. And that's what happened with that board. And they set a standard. So I said, well, I'm going to bring in uh, hairstylists so uh, people can get their hair cut. And let's have a bus for some field trips, because, you know, people didn't last long back then at the house. They were a resident, and they could do something lovely. And, charming and a little trip. That was doing the right thing. There was a time, though, when you had to explain fisting to a little boy. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Without me? <laughs> uh, that young man would, it, would be uh, R.J. Melman, who is the son of the restaurateur, Gucci Melman. I had an interesting uh, collection of students <laughs> <laughs> in uh, 
Latin and Parker, I had the Pritzker kids, I had all the Levy kids, Larry Levy's kids. Uh, it's very interesting. They negotiated. They said, how can we get our children picked up at the very last part of the route, even though they live the furthest in the Gold Coast? I said, well, what do you propose? Well, at the end of the year, we'll give you a thousand bucks. I said, I guess I'll see you at five to nine, Paul. Well, that's, that's exactly what we did. Uh, we still made it to school on time, but every Thursday, the papers would come out, and on my way to Anchi Emmett, I'd stop by and see Feathers at uh, uh, Buddies. Not Buddies. Buddies. Uh, Aldine and Broadway. No, um, Wellington and Broadway. By, by Richard Cook's Crazy Mary. What was the, the name? The Bulldog Bar. Bulldog Bar. Bulldog Bar. Bulldog Bar. I pull the bus over. I couldn't leave the students unattended, so they come in with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, Feathers knew all their names. And, oh, hi, Mia. Did you do your homework? <laughs> RJ, you said you were having a problem in science. You all oh, got a tour. Everything's good. And I pick up Gay Chicago and it was Gay Light, or maybe it was Windy City and Outlines. And off we go, make the drop. I usually spend the rest of the day at the age unit uh, at the Sonic because uh, I had midday and I knew every patient out there. And I wanted to be there for the doctors making their rounds so at the end of the day when their partners would come home from work, I could fill them in. Well, this is what I've heard, this is what I know. So, uh, I see Archer reclining on the seat of the bus with his legs crossed, and he must have been reading the personal ads. And back then, unlike now, there were a lot of personal ads. Mm -hmm. It was not the internet. And I think he picked up some phraseology that he, saw, <laughs> and he spit out at the dinner table. <laughs> said something like, oh, R.J. was asking about some uh, avant-garde publication. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> she, I know, she didn't say a whole lot, but on the bus, I said, R.J., what was your mom referring to? Well, I read an ad about fisting, and I just couldn't understand what it was. <laughs>
I just, uh, I found it so superior. And I found it uh, mesmerizing. And when the plague hit, it, it, it showed me this is, a, this is the only group that could have survived. Any other group would have completely uh, collapsed. Probably. And I just thought, I thought my notion of a superior gene, I think, was correct. I think it was accurate. And I still think that. I'm told you're an anarchist at heart. <laughs> <laughs> How was that? Uh, Understatement? I don't know. Uh, I guess from Lee and Blue McCannon raising their children to do the right thing and speak their mind, uh, our dad being so articulate, uh, he didn't, he, he, you know, it's funny, several years ago, Open Hand had one of these uh, quack facilitators come in. It bugged me that they paid this broad <laughs> when we were having money troubles. And I think it was to create a cohesive team, which obviously was absurd and never happened. Uh, you were to use some words to describe yourself, three words to describe yourself, and they would analyze it. And I thought I'd just be honest. I wrote, uh, bombastic, <laughs> and irritating. Um, I think just because I was raised that way. When you see so many wrong things, you know, um, we're being raised in a Jewish home. I, I never knew about anti-Semitism until college because of the world I lived in. Uh, it was <coughs> so foreign to me. I couldn't even articulate the hatefulness of it. And, uh, and homophobia and AIDS phobia and racism. I mean, I went to East Garfield when Dr. King came to town. I, I, the abhorrent behavior that I was watching on the news, I, I couldn't, I, I just couldn't accept it. I couldn't, I didn't, because I wasn't, I wasn't around that growing up. I didn't feel that way. I didn't think that way. The hatred did not inspire me to become hateful, but to just be resolved to continue doing the right thing. Wow. Tell us a bit about your fascination with Greek culture. Some of the Bergman films and 
oh man, it was a challenge. But I finally got it. I finally got it. Those classes were magnificent. Uh, so I was fortunate. Do you have any opportunities to speak in Greek with other people? When a client, uh, it, I don't have that many Greek clients at all, but uh, I, I do occasionally. But in going to some of these Greek man clubs back then, the dialects, many are uh, men, uh, Hercules. I remember Hercules. <laughs> he's, from a, he's from a village, and so some of the time, I mean, mine was educated, Professor Benitez Kiriazopoulos. I didn't know slang. Um, so in many ways, we weren't communicating, and what I was speaking was foreign to them. I was trying to follow, and then I figured, let's dance. That's <laughs> <laughs> kind of universal. Did you break plates doing this? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I didn't light up the Saganaki between uh, all this aquanet and my nails. <laughs> Take care of the sick. 
you honor your commitment, you honor your friendship. <coughs> and, and, and volunteers have not missed a beat now in 23 years, and not to mention the donors, the merchants in the communities. I don't want Tom Dombrowski to think, I put him down. I don't want Danny Sotomayor to strike me dead with a thunderbolt. <laughs> <laughs> because we all made a commitment. You know, it's funny. He always wanted to do a meal to the free route with me. And every time we tried, something cut him down. He was in the hospital. Same thing with his partner, Scott McPherson. Every time we would try, not, not well enough to make us, well, I'm going to head out and we'll do it. And do it. Same thing with uh, Jamie's partner, Billy Albius. He would follow me on the street, shirtless on his roller skates. When, when can I do the meals with you? We try, and every time we make a date, it didn't work. So you know what? I'm delivering those meals for the guys, and I'm <coughs> bagging the groceries and meeting with vendors because budget-wise, like any AIDS program across the country, uh, we're hurting. And I'm going by Sidetrack is kicking off our Back to Basics program with the understanding we have a spot to press. Sidetrack said, you're, you're in trouble, aren't you? I said, yeah, kind of. Um, well, your party is coming up, you know, the anniversary party. Is it 28 years, I think? It is. 28 years is kind of a milestone when you think about uh, any business. Absolutely. A, a bar business in these tough times. And so this is our 16th year, Sweet 16, collecting for our low-income clients. And Sidetrack and Chuck and Arthur and Peggy said, well, what can we do to stock your shelves? Because we usually collect personal care items, which are essential. But this time, we're going back to basics of canned goods, needed canned goods. And the few pennies I do have, I'll put to the high price items. And you know what those items are from your own time, <coughs> your clients, the needs, the pleasures. Right. And so sidetrack, like in so many areas, is kicking off what's now going And from sidetrack, Shake Chicago picked up on it and donated ad space. Now, ad space is open to a magazine. And they donated a half page ad. The second one just came out, and they're going to do all five weeks of June, oh. asking people to, and it's been a tremendous response. So, Sidetrack has never forgotten our mission. They make it effortless for us, and we're looking forward this Wednesday honoring their customers who are so generous and loyal. <coughs> by remembering our clients. Just going right back to the community, just when you think you, you got nothing else to give, maybe there's a buy one, get one can of soup. Is that this Wednesday evening? This Wednesday the 16th. Sidetrack will have its uh, anniversary party. It's a big bash. They say thank you to their customers. The staffs are generous. We're out on the street like, like Evelyn Gypsies. <laughs> 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 tell you something about that night, whether it be the anniversary party in June or the Christmas party in December, it's like, you know, again, trend setting. They, they started the adopt a Rep program of meal delivery in 1988. And Arthur said, on any given Thursday, you will have two of our employees. It could be a bar bag and a doorman. could be bookkeeper and the bartender. And that's how it works. And then from there, other businesses said, well, we can adopt a route on a bridge, in the closet. And it was the community, again, looking out for its own. Family and values. Family values. And there's, there's something about breaking bread with somebody that, you know, they bond with them. <clears throat> something, something intimate about delivering a meal and having somebody in their underpants open the door because they've just been feverish and puking all day and the only human they've seen is you from the last 24 hours that the last volunteer left and so it's important. It's important. Well, I read something very interesting in the book, Report from the Holocaust by Larry Kramer. He states that AIDS didn't just happen. It was allowed to happen. And in a previous interview, you stated that 
people were allowed to die because the government didn't care. Yeah, I still say that. How, how they is were, that? I say the government is a bunch of murderers. They knew full well what was going on, and for 12 years they kept that information away from doctors, scientists, medical community, and of course their patients. How can you ever get past that? You lost 12 years, and look what happened. It got so out of control, the mutation. You can never make that up. They knew they were quibbling between uh, who's going to get the patent rights for the HIV test. People are dying. Who's going to take credit for a treatment? People are dying. And everyone in this room, they, they, know, the, they know the experience. Our life in the 80s was that of we became medieval people. Death was our constant companion. Yeah. We celebrated birthdays in the age units. We went to Oscar parties in the age units. We continued. I mean, the creative people were still doing um, symphonies, ballets, evening gowns while they were dying. It was unbelievable. What was our social life? Oh yeah, maybe six funerals a week. Everybody knew where I sat if they were looking for me. I knew where John Henry sat. We did it. And yet, I said this at Daddy's funeral, at uh, Jim Dore's funeral, well Daddy. Somehow, and in no way is this being disrespectful, amidst the tragedy, the dying, and the suffering, we, we still had fun. We laughed you know? and we cried. Yeah. I mean, I go down to the original Gold Coast on Clark Street, movie night, movie night. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Dottie was my bartender. Always had my manchette, it's ready for me. <laughs> so, so didn't have to order a lot, you know, it just was always there. And you know, we could talk about you know, another Kate escalation on this guy, that you were worried. And, Oh boy, uh, things aren't looking good. And then it was kind of, you know, work and, and different things. That whole culture, it, it's different now. It's a new day, but that doesn't mean people still don't need services, attention, support, especially the old timers. They're waiting for that other shoe to drop. You've been on toxic meds for 27 years, you know what? Your body is going to reject. Yeah. And the phenomenon, nobody in the old days lived long enough for the great thrill and joy of dementia. long <laughs> enough. <laughs> now, you know, there's others, all, or our clients at the pantry, the seniors, they're getting hip replacements. They're getting arthritis like, like a senior citizen. So, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the onset of the AIDS crisis here in Chicago. How were you aware of it? What did you see as it initially intruded? What I saw was a group of us were paying attention to the reports coming out of San Francisco and New York, the two epicenters. We were supremely confident, oh, it will never happen here. That's the West Coast. That's the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Boy, were we were. I called every gay physician I knew, and I asked for uh, uh, time for lectures and teachings. I wanted them to assemble us in their homes to tell us the latest information, to try and protect our friends, to try and get word out, because nobody else was. Everything was being dismissed. Observations by uh, the professionals in the Midwest noticing the patterns. Uh, the, the type of pneumonia that was so rare. They were putting, they were connecting the dots and they were speaking deaf ears. Deaf ears. <coughs> so when Larry says people were allowed to die, that's different than saying people die. Oh, isn't that a shame? Being allowed to die, that's a holocaust. Yes, it is. That's a holocaust. And, well, then, you know, look at the, again, maybe that superior gene was in the Jews during the 40s in, in Nazi Germany. Those who survived, those who were fortunate enough, it required that kind of 
So, no. When I was in the room at the a Gay and Lesbian Center in New York the night where he spoke, and his opening line was a bombshell. Here's a man standing in a room full of guys, and they all look the same. They had their Doc Martens, they had their Levi's, they had their motorcycle jacket, they looked good. And he looked, he didn't speak for the first 45 seconds, and I was leaning against a pole. No one would give me a seat. <laughs> uh, they were just standing room only, because they were going to announce a new organization. And here's Larry, they knew the playwright Larry, and they kind of knew the rap and the rabble rouser. And after 45 seconds of surveying his empire, he said, one year from now, a third of the people in this room will be dead. That's his opening line. Wow. And he was right. I was with Peter Staley and Mark and Michael Harrington of the TAG group, what would become the uh, treatment uh, action group. And they listened, and he wanted people to organize and do direct action. Now, his biggest health problem wasn't necessarily HIV. He remained asymptomatic for a bit. His big problem was hepatitis B. Well, of course, liver disease was his tyrant, which got him to his liver transplant, first ever HIV patient, and guess who did the surgery? His arch enemy. Anthony Fauci of the National <laughs> Institute of Health. <laughs> really? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. He said, I hope you understand, Anthony, publicly. I still got to go after you because you're the enemy. He goes, I understand, Larry. That's okay. But I want to do your transplant. Wow. And he did a good job. But, um, yeah, you know, New York was ready. New York was ready to heed the call because they were fighting for their lives. Yes. And when you're fighting for your life, you are motivated to direct action, getting arrested. And Larry was a great uh, band leader. You know, he worked as well. For his detractors, well, you know. And he has many. His style was not comfortable for everyone. Just like in Chicago, Danny Sotomayor's style wasn't comfortable. But, you know, after his death, some of Danny's detractors came to appreciate his efforts. Because Danny was all the way out there. Matter of fact, he was all the way out there on a ledge. <laughs> at the county building. Let's talk a little bit about Danny Sotomayor. Who, who was he? How did you meet him? Who was he? Well, who is that man who's always angry at me? He's <laughs> and why is he yelling at me? <laughs> Danny was in the background the year. Do you remember? Well, I know many people here remember. Every Memorial Day weekend, there was a uh, candlelight vigil where the winner <coughs> and the entire host committee of IML would kick off a candlelight march yes. from a church in Lincoln Park to the former site of Howard Brown Memorial Clinic. And that was at George Street, uh, which is near Tabusi and Halstead. This memorial service at the church was a common gathering place to come and grieve. Uh, fabric panels were taken out each year, and people would include the name, names of people they've lost. And uh, there was always a beautiful choir. It was kind of a, a gathering place. People who hadn't seen each other, you pay your respects. And then the color guard would be Mr current IML of the night before, and committee and first runner-up and second runner-up, and we would hold our candles and march to plant trees in the parking lot of Howard Ground. This year I'm marching with my dear friend Jeff Fields. He's since passed away. Uh, and we're walking, and as we get to the parking lot, he goes, oh, there's my, there's my little buddy. I hear he's been sick, and I, I'm looking. I'm, I guess it was Danny. Uh, he said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna go talk with this guy, and well, you know, me, beeline to the buffet." 
and George lets them stay there. <laughs> <laughs> They've created a habitat at the bar when they travel, so George is comfortable. George is only 34 or 35 and will probably live to be in his 80s. They do live a long time. Yes. But uh, having George on his perch, this beautiful green wing macaw, under an umbrella because it was always hot, ice water, grapes. Danny could make a few pennies drawing caricatures. And, oh, little girl, sit down. I can do you like a damsel in distress. You can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then he would introduce this bird with the, you know, the chomas and the mother would freeze. And they, Danny would put a grape in his mouth. The kids were one over. Here, the parents were petrified. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he was able to draw. I always had um, uh, petitions that we would send to Springfield and do AIDS funding, AIDS awareness to Governor Thompson. And, uh, and a good team. And a good team. How did Danny channel his energy into act up? <coughs> How did that? Forcefully. Danny, <laughs> well, in Chicago, the group was for AIDS rights with uh, the late Ferdy Egan and Mary Patton and uh, Paul Adams. Danny came to the quilt display of 1988 in Washington. I went to every one of them. Danny did not go to the one in 87. He took a trip to Europe uh, where he went skydiving in Spain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had pictures, and he just loved it. But the summer of 88, which was a hot one, uh, you know, we hosted the quilt at the Old Navy Pier with the lawn sheds. That was historic. It was the summer. People gathered at 822 West Roscoe to come up with a program called Open Hand Chicago. The same group that hosted the quilt, we got the names for the uh, Open Hand group. And the display of 88 promised ACT UP New York would be hosting with the local chapters around the country for a huge demonstration to shut down the FDA in Rockville, Maryland. This was a huge success. Yes. Um, at the last minute, Danny said, you know what? I'm going to go to uh, the quilt display. Back then, all the travel agencies offered scholarships for PWAs. I worked on a lot of fundraisers so that PWAs were able to go to see the quilt, work the quilts. Uh, so that's what happened. Danny came to Washington and kind of butted heads with Cleve. <laughs> <laughs> he was given the assignment to run the cherry picker up and down for international journals to make aerial photographs of the historic display of the quilt. The walkways, we were on the ellipse, October. And Cleve's feathers were ruffled, and he comes up to me, and he's huffing and puffing. Now, he and Danny and Larry Kramer already had had words when the quilt was being laid out, because they were selling the silence equals death button. He says, excuse me, the only merchandising on this quilt will be names project merchandise. If I have made myself clear, you cease and desist. Well, there we bring this night used to anyone speaking to him like that. And then he had no use for the quilt. He kept calling it the fucking AIDS rug. <laughs> because it, to him, it was a defeatist thing instead of, a, he's, he understands the respectful homage, but at the time, so I tried to defuse the situation. Uh, I see them <laughs> quibbling, and I go, oh, tell me about the question. Uh, yeah, what do you want? <coughs> oh, I don't know. Do you ever think about scotch guarding this thing? <laughs> <laughs> Up. They had their press passes, international crowd, uh, local crowd, parents. He 
useless. I have a problem with Danny. I said, well, how does that mean? He's working. Well, if there are representatives of a publication he doesn't like, he won't take them up. <laughs> Why? Well, that's where my airline ticket is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a luggage. 
And we hear the engine starting, and everybody on the plane is wondering, Danny, Lori, uh, you know, he's still got all the, the um, powder from the sprays. And I said, well, we got to get his ticket. Well, some nice gay attendant <laughs> was kind enough to go down to luggage in the plane, secure the ticket, they're just about ready to pull off. We come in the airline, uh, the plane, thunderous applause, and Danny's wheels are now turning about coming back to Chicago. It's <coughs> renaming the Chicago for AIDS Rights Group Act of Chicago and showing solidarity with the group that he had just spent the last 12 hours with in a successful demonstration, a cohesive one. And that was kind of the beginning of him finding a way to channel the rage as a man living with AIDS, as a man who was brutalized physically and sexually by his dad, just like his sisters were every day of their life till their 20s. Wow. And he left the family's nest in Hyde Park and terrified the mother. She did not want him telling stories about the family. She wanted everyone to live in that building. He was a gay man. He wanted a gay life. And that meant Lakeview. And between his artwork was Paul Adams, who approached him and said, you know, you're a cartoon. Do you ever think about getting published? He goes, no. Well, I'm asking you to think about it. Uh, got friends at Gay Chicago. Matter of fact, Paul was writing that awful travelogue after he <laughs> went to Berlin from the bar of Berlin. He was, oh, it was just dreadful. Joey, <laughs> yes, it was awful. Yes. But that's okay. Uh, I mean, he won a trip. He wrote about everything endlessly. Like he was vaccinated with a phonograph needle. <coughs> And he got Danny published every week as a political cartoonist, of which I shared. Now, there's 200 original cartoons. They're in the possession of an archivist, Victor Salvo, because when he heard I had a flood in my basement one year, he said, oh, gosh, what a mess. Oh, by the way, where are the cartoons? I said, oh, yeah, they're in the basement. They come out. I must have them. I go, OK. <laughs> so he's got them. And matter of fact, after Danny died, and the family decided to come after me and Victor because they wanted their cartoons, not for any financial gain. They wanted to destroy any evidence that Danny was a proud man living with AIDS and was gay. So I sent them to Larry. And he said, send them. Not in an archaeological dig will that mother ever find those cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> Activist and an artist, um, 
He really loves the mark, you know, personally, professionally. His partner, his dog. Let's switch gears a little bit <clears throat> and talk about open hand. How did open hand begin? And I, and I understand that the Chicago Health Fire Club benefited open hand. I will say, I think my, you have what my <laughs> respect and appreciation, uh, all right, we'll start. I mentioned the quilt display. It was on a national tour. Deborah Resnick was driving a rider rental truck called Stella. <laughs> she drove from city to city. <clears throat> and in Chicago, uh, she delivered the quilt with Scott Lago. Yes. Uh, so many people that are gone from the San Francisco committee. And uh, there we were, the summer of 88, brutally hot, a drought year. Except for the rain. But we had a cloudburst. Oh my. For all of two minutes on that Sunday, and between the leaky roof and the uh, floor of Navy here, uh, rust spots were dripping. And the famous Chicago rain plant came to be by the visqueen that Paul Aird found. <laughs> we learned all about visqueen. The, the layers uh, thin and thick. We covered up everything. Anyway, Cleve was panic stricken that we're going home, that's it. No, it stayed. We stayed up all night hand washing the rust stops, the veins on those, and we got those cyclonic commercial fans to dry everything off. And it worked. I think San Francisco was very impressed by everything they saw here, and they should be impressed. It was an amazing accomplishment. And I would say the host committee, of which I was part, went through a little postpartum blues. You work on a project with very little egos. Uh, yes. Mayor Eugene Sawyer, extremely supportive, <laughs> providing signage on the expressway, which, you know, back in 88, that was a big step. Yes. Proclamations, promotion. Remember the bus cards? Yes. Everything about it was a magnificent display. Closing ceremony, they had to cast the great girls to come, sing a special closing number. Danny, Nixon. Danny did not come to that display until the closing ceremony because we dedicated 600 panels that weekend of just Chicago. Uh, I want to say Chicago boys, but there might have been a few babies from the pediatric age unit at Children's Memorial and a few girls. But there were 600 panels dedicated. Then we were just straight with everything. Danny came out with the dinner we hosted afterwards. It was very hard for him, very emotional. And the committee thought, you know, we work well together. Why stop? And we gathered. <coughs> and we thought, what is the one thing we should do next? And we, we just knew we had to feed people. Uh, housing was set up. I mean, we could have gone into pet care. We could have gone into any number of things. But the feeding of people just seemed so basic. And we decided we would model ourselves after Project Open here in San Francisco. Yes. And I went out to meet Ruth Brinker, the little senior citizen girl who used to, first she had comments by making hot brownies for the AIDS community. <laughs> and then in the church basement, she just started making meals. And everybody galvanized behind her. So we didn't know that was going to be our name. I came up with a few that were not taken like uh, Mabel, Mabel, set the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, said, I can see what They said too many words. Oh, okay. Stone soup. I thought the story, the two, two words. No. Um, <coughs> food or roll express. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, after 20 names, I gave up, but I did offer one last one out of frustration. Make AIDS. They didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Project Open Hand Chicago. Drivers. <clears throat> I'm a bus driver. I can put routes together. 
we found that well, Matthew was at one time volunteer coordinator at Howard Brown, he knew case managers. We did everything until Tom Tiny walked up and he says, no, they organized well. Did real good except one thing. What about a kitchen? I went, oh, for Pete's sake, you're right. He says, you can use mine. And that's what we did. We had a little press event in November. Ann Sanders announcing this program. Christmas Eve, 88, first deliveries. I have to say, I hand wrote every directional, turn by turn, of every route that night. <coughs> However, there was one driver who knew better. And he got lost. <coughs> and I told Greg Harris he should have <laughs> <that> attention. <laughs> scenario when I, I hear him speak publicly about that first row. Because it was a snowy night, it was a cold night, it was, you know, I finally got to my last parent, uh, uh, my last uh, client. He didn't say he was lost. He said, I finally got to my last client. And he was sitting in the hallway with his pajamas and slippers and robe and looked at me and said, it didn't forget me. No, the client said, gee, I've been waiting forever in a damn hallway. Because <laughs> I talked to the client, David. He said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, after that delivery, I knew I was doing the right thing. And I urge you to support this program. I thought, well, I know what really happened, but that's okay. I didn't <laughs> so, um, we had started over the holidays, and as of January 1st, that year of 89, <coughs> we were on the road every night. How did the Chicago Hellfire Club benefit the program? They approached me in, well, that was in March of 89, and said, you know what, Laura, you're going to need a place to get phone messages from volunteers and clients you're going to need a mimeograph machine. <laughs> You're going to need that IBM selector. And we're offering you rent-free your first year in office space. How do you thank somebody for that? I think we How do you acknowledge a gen? I said, well, wait a minute. What about you fellas? Oh, we'll come by every couple of weeks. Uh, there's office supplies there. You need a location. Because we had basically been, you know, kind of flopping around. Don't forget, there was no staff. Right. Everyone was a volunteer. There was no board. It was just a program fueled by good intentions. Renslow sure would call me from Cook County Hospital. And uh, a him and Brown Sable, Laura. We can't save our patients, but we can feed them. You got a West Side Brown? Sure, Renslow. Everybody got involved. Arthur and Pepe's business started the adopter route. My only university social work department said, you got any clients at Rogers Park? I said, yeah, about six routes home. We'll take three of them every Wednesday. Wow. And it's funny, because I spent a lot of time at the age unit at the Sonic, as you know. Not just for Danny and Scott, for a lot of people. And around a quarter to five, I'd always leave and say, well, I go to my will. Nurses would see me get out of the elevator. They never asked me until one night. Dr. Black says, What do you do? Deliver newspapers? That's my heart. I said, No, we deliver meals. But all these nurses are listening. Like, really? I'm off on Monday. Great, I'll meet you at Ann Sailors. We'll wow. deliver to some of your patients. And so everybody really wanted to do the right thing. I don't think there's too many people in the gay community of Chicago that doesn't have a connection one way or another. Um, they filled in on a route. They were a runner. They packed meals. Oh, first volunteer to get thrown out of Tom Tunney's kitchen. <laughs> Unfortunately. Lauren Furtick. <laughs> uh, she was a burgeoning caterer at the time and said, I, I'll pack meals. Well, she started one day they yelling coming out of the kitchen. She didn't think there was enough soup in the portion. She didn't like the presentation of the uh, hot roast. 
She didn't like the packaging. He says, you are fired me. Get the hell out of my kitchen. She goes, I'm a volunteer. You can't fire me. And he says, I can hold the door and out you go. <laughs> I said, I appreciate, I appreciate your passion, Lord. Uh, she says, well, I guess I'm a driver. I said, okay. <laughs> so, fueled by good intentions, everyone wanted to be part of doing something. They had friends who were getting meals, or they had uh, co-workers, or, you know, back then, landlords were trying to evict you, and you know, insurance companies were <coughs> dropping you, and nutrition was uh, uncertain, so, Someone like a Dorothy Thufstead, who would clutch the client's hand and give them a nice, firm grab to touch them, just to touch See, them, yes. and put little stickers <coughs> on the lunch boxes. And Dorothy's unique because she volunteers at a lot at a, a gay and gay organizations, and usually the politics bother her. The, Staff bothered her. She stayed with us a long time. Yes. And she, uh, her route is she's a senior citizen, worked hospices, AIDS care hospice, Chicago House hospice. But uh, there would be Dorothy Clefstead with birthday cards because she knew it would always be the last birthday. She wanted to make it memorable. We knew the meals we delivered on Christmas Eve, that would be the last Christmas. So there I am on the south side, which I know very well from, you know, the, the blues bars. Except I got a little turned around because of Louis Farrakhan's mosque. <laughs> 76th and Stoney. I had a client on 73rd. Place. I found 73rd Street. I found 74th Street. Where the hell is 73rd Place? I'm riding with Enid in her pickup truck. She says, for God's sake, let's call this man. He'll die of malnutrition before he dies of <laughs> I said, Enid, hold on a second. We're going to have another driver going out tomorrow. I got a little no. We found it. We backed up an alley. We backed up two alleys, went through a one-way street the wrong way onto a cul-de-sac. I said, look. 73rd place. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm not going to call anybody. There he is. I said, I learned something about your street. He says, well, don't learn, don't, it won't stick on the road because I'm moving next week. <laughs> <laughs> he says, he says, yeah, I'm moving into Roseland. I said, well, we'll, we'll find you. And um, he didn't last too much longer after the move. But he was tickled with the groceries, the uh, lovely meals, and he brought gifts. He brought gifts, but yes, uh, 40, I still remember my, all my, 4625 South Drexel, my first stop, Christmas Eve. A lot of the neighborhood regulars had been out uh, enjoying the festive season. I was wearing an updo that night <laughs> with some Christmas ornaments in it. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this uh, man uh, was enjoying himself probably all week. Kind of falls against me. He goes, what do you call that hairstyle? And you know, I knew I'd be meeting some new people every week. And I didn't want to estrange anyone. You know, I may need to make a phone call one night. Or I might have a flat tire one night. Hmm. And uh, I looked at him. I said, well, sir, this is my Dairy Queen uh, swirl. <laughs> <laughs> He says, I really like it. In life, chances are we might have never crossed paths. <laughs> and he also said, oh, meals, how can I get some? I think that's a reasonable request. I said, oh, this is a city program. You ask your social worker about it. I didn't say too much, I didn't say too little, and I didn't breach confidentiality. Right. You know, back then, people were very, you know, my client in Humboldt Park, Dean, I think Dean Ogren will remember this. Route sheets. <coughs> Be discreet. Jacqueline has not discussed with her neighbors her illness. Okay. Beautiful brownstone. Kilo off of Armitage. 
I'm going to be discreet. <laughs> and I ring the doorbell and off the third floor, that woman sticks her head out. I go, hello, oh, I have a delivery. Okay. She loads a bucket on twine. Debbie 
relocated, put her life in order, and commuse. So I would say these individuals are above and beyond when it comes to volunteering. They enjoy the work they do, but what tickles me is they enjoy each other. Remember <coughs> the bus driver? Do the clients not? The very first volunteer to sign up on Tuesdays in 1994, first week, there was Leonard on break from his route with CTA. So everybody's story. And speaking of meals, we now inherit partners of longtime drivers. The one, the only, Raymond and Kurt. It's one, it's one word, Raymond and Kurt. <laughs> Raymond and Kurt on Fridays. Retired school teacher of Lakeview High School, currently unavailable on Fridays, but the next generation, Kurt and Susan. One word, Kurt and Susan. <laughs> so in the middle of everything, Rand, um, Raymond's partner, Van Franny, has stepped in. Gourmet chef, raconteur, bon vivant. Yeah, everybody's got such interesting backgrounds, and they all blend the demeanor of the Tuesday group, the Thursday group. We've got floaters. Sky is one of our new volunteers in the last couple of years. Found his niche. I think at Grocery Land, there's, there's a, a role for everybody because it, people are dedicated to serving. And as I said, lucky me, I get to be around these wonderful people every week of every month. Maybe not so much on Yom Kippur. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a great ride, you know? And one day, and I say this all the time, I would long for the day we just shut our doors. We're not needed anymore. We did a good job. And then I'll move on to something else. From your mouth to God's ear. It would be such a pleasure. Don't know if it will happen in my lifetime. Uh, we've assured the clients, the partners, their families, as long as we're needed, they can count on us. Which is why right now during these challenging times, I am going back to basics, right back to the community to help us stop our shelves, to meet our mission, to serve the clients, because, you know, if the country is struggling, our clients are struggling double. Absolutely. And we see it. We see it with the substance abuse and crystal meth, and we know they're self-medicating, and then mental illness, and they can't get an appointment for services. Uh, I mean, we see it all. You see it all, um, and you want to try to do the right thing. Look at all the clients we have who are literate. Can you imagine to be 40s, 50s, still not be able to read? We never, well, sometimes you mock them. <laughs> Uh, one of uh, Judy's clients on Howard Street, Mr. Hardaway. 
and it was too much for them. I guess that year. Also, that was the year of the fentanyl-based heroin, and he got a hot dose of it. And sadly, that was it. He was seen being taken out in a body bag by another client. So I'm sure you heard about Mr. Hardaway, and I thought he meant bad times coming. Beware. Well, this was different. Yeah. So. You never know what's going on with the client when they first hit the door. In the early days, their parents told them, oh, I don't think you should come home for Thanksgiving this year, Chris. Your sister will be here with the baby. Chris was devastated. I had already given out my X number of turkeys. Chris said, well, I guess I'll have a holiday at home. That's when you get over the jewel, you buy a turkey, and Chris was able to you know, get through the holidays because he was very hurt. Tell us about the Jefferson Award that you won. Well, I brought the Jefferson Award because I think it's a great testament to the volunteers of Open Hand. In all the years since Jackie Onassis and Sergeant Shriver and Eunice started this wonderful organization honoring community service in cities around America. The one, and it was in the 70s, I think it was 72. 72 was a big year. Mm -hmm. um, what are the years? I was glued to them. Mm -hmm. Sam Bergen. Uh, this program honored, on a local level, the good works of just local citizens in uh, uh, working with disadvantaged youth, literacy, like the woman who won with me this senior, the late Joanne Alter, community activist whose son Jonathan is an activist <coughs> me. Uh, and Open Hand is the one and only program dealing with AIDS that has ever been acknowledged. And I consider that on behalf of the volunteers, both living and dead, who contributed so much, how did this come up for this award? Uh, a man walked, a young, a young man walked in on a wintry day in December of 96. And it was snowing. It was a day we were closed. It was a Wednesday. And he, we were at 3902 Sheridan. And he walked in. He said he was from California. He was very sick. And he was trying to arrange through Howard Brown some medication. Well, that's all I needed to hear. Because not that anyone ever told you. <laughs> but I was able to get him some meds that he needed by uh, a friend who stockpiles. And he was hungry. I had gotten him a room at the Julian Hotel. Where's the Julian? It's not there anymore. Torn down, huh? I don't keep up. I guess where the yellow cab bus barn, or the, the uh, terminal was on Halstead the other day. <laughs> they said, where have you been? I said, I guess I didn't pay attention. They said, it's not there anymore. I said, yeah, I noticed that. Uh, I got him some groceries. He had a little hot plate and a little uh, uh, chest freezer, you know, like when he had in college. And he was able to eat. And uh, he never forgot that experience. I asked him to keep coming in and getting groceries. He had a crush, and of course he didn't, on Tony Galimi. And uh, he would talk about Tony. I said, well, you know, Tony is a volunteer. He just did a route last night. He was really, I knew he was a good person. I knew he is. And he's always so beautiful. I think. Mm -hmm. And so he was getting to know Chicago a little bit because he was from LA. I think he had family in Indiana, but he was kind of a detached person. <coughs> the whole thing of services. He, he got his meds, he was able to eat, and he just found. Oh, Leonard was extremely gracious when he finally came to meet him. His name is Jeremy. And uh, the experience was a good one. He 
he eventually relocated to California, but before leaving, he saw a commercial about this award that would be honoring Chicagoans, and if anyone wanted to make a, uh, a nomination for him, he, was, he considered himself kind of a buddy writer. And he put something together very simple, how he was sick, didn't know how much time he had, but in Chicago he found a place that welcomed him and fed him and offered resources. And he said, boy, they do great work. And all of a sudden I'm getting a call from Larry Wirt at Channel 5 about the Jefferson. Of course, I'm being a smart ass. I go, oh, Wheezy, you mean? <laughs> Called having a good heart 
and just you know, doing the right thing. So the goodness that abounds uh, is uh, unparalleled. Unparalleled. <coughs> do ghosts visit you? Yeah, I'm grateful that they do. I've had visitations. I remember the night Danny came to visit me and sat on my bed, and I had something sharp on the nightstand, and I jabbed myself to make sure that I wasn't dreaming. And the next morning, boy, did that hurt. <laughs> yeah, it was for a few seconds, you know. He was sitting on my bed, looking healthy, full head of hair. Because, you know, at the end, he had that Uncle Fester appeal. <laughs> and gorgeous head of hair from uh, the chemo uh, was gone. Uh, John Henry did a visitation, and it was the length of the window at the pantry in Sheridan. So he was sitting on the bus, and I looked up, and there's the bus, and there's the cap, and there at the baseball cap the Cubs had, and there's a tie and a flannel shirt and a windbreaker. And as the bus turned, you know how Sheridan goes south and then it goes east by the old Carlos Hotel? I ran outside, but um, I had visitations, they can. We've had clients have visitations. Our client, two months before he died, was struggling at St. Joe. Poor David, that just was a nightmare. And he called me from intensive care. He asked to be taken off the respirator long enough to make a short phone call to me how Daddy had come to visit him. And I'm thinking, well, you know, you're on a respirator. It's oxygen deprivation. He said, no, that day I wasn't on the respirator. And I woke up, and Daddy was sitting at the foot of his bed, and he said, David, it's not your time. Yet. It's not your time. So David, maybe three, four months after that, although he was not expected to last the evening. So I welcome that. It comforts me. It comforts me, and I'm very open to the visitation. Amazing. Whereas a visitation from me would probably put <laughs>